and lover of all things lit, professional reviewer, recommender, book blogger. I am your host, Lloyd Russell, aka The Book Sage, and you're listening to Lit with Lloyd, courtesy of KCAT Radio. Welcome to Lit with Lloyd. I am your host, Lloyd Russell, and our guest author today, courtesy of KCAT Radio, is Mary Curtis. Mary is the founder and CEO of Pacifico, a, quote, brand-focused strategic communications firm, unquote, based in Silicon Valley. So before we start talking about your authorship and your books, tell us a little bit about Pacifico. I mean, that's what you've been doing for quite a few years. Uh, How did it get started, and are you still active in it? Well, Lloyd, I started the company at the ripe old age of 24. And I did not know what I did not know, which is a very good thing to do when you're that young and you're starting a company. But over time, I learned a whole lot. I loved being in my own business, and we grew to service many of the uh, locally-based high-tech company, leading high-tech companies, many of them publicly traded, all of them global in nature. And along the way, we became one of the largest independently owned PR and branding firms in Silicon Valley. That's great. Is it still active? It's uh, very inactive. I basically have a consultancy now, and I will take projects that are of interest to me, and those run far and few between, Hmm. because I'm very busy with other things. I'm, I'm a venture capital partner, and I spend a good share of time Uh, writing, as you might imagine. And the writing came only fairly recently, right? In the last few years? It came uh, about 14 years. I've always known I was going to be a writer, but I started really applying myself about 14 or 15 years ago. And along the way, I find now that I built up a tremendous inventory of stuff that I'm just starting to shape into meaningful little volumes. Okay, so your f- first two books were books of poetry. Right. And what what led you to poetry? Well, when I started poetry, I kind of thought it was a bad habit. <laughs> and um, I really felt that I was a nonfiction writer and a memoirist. But I went to college again when my daughters were in college, and I got a master's in fine arts. And my first advisor read some of my poems and he said, no, 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 Mary, you're going to write poetry in this school. And so I did. And I came out with a hundred some odd poems that uh, were in various uh, stages of needing help, but I try my best to help them. (laughs) Well, you came to our book club meeting and we talked about uh, the White Tree Quartet. Right. uh, And... um, our members really enjoyed them. But you also have one called Between Rooms. Right. That was actually the first. That was the first. Okay. Uh, And now, moving along a bit, you're about ready to launch, or have you already launched your latest book? And tell us about that one. Well, the two books of poetry came out in 2016 and 2018, respectively. And... um, Between Rooms, the first one, was really a a grief story. The arc of the story was grief and finding myself again after the loss of my first husband. Mm -hmm. The new book that I'm launching is a series of essays. I call it Memoir and Essays. And it has a little bit of the grief, grief themes in it, but it's also very different from the poetry, as you might expect. Yeah. Poetry rubs off into prose and uh, particularly the lyric quality of poetry. But uh, this is very different. It came together mm, with some effort out of that body of essays that I've been building up over, you know, the years since I started writing. I actually had written another memoir, and I'm really glad it didn't get published. (laughs) But some of the stuff in this book is pulled from that and repurposed in a a new way. What what actually um, led you to write the memoir or to compile the essays for the memoir? That's a really good question. <laughs> I'm driven sometimes by my own title. I wrote 
a uh, an essay called Death and Birth in Yellow Medicine County. And when I submitted it to a literary magazine where it was published, I just sort of spur of the moment changed the title to Understanding Moonseed. And it turns out that that becomes thematic for the entire volume because moonseed is this plant that grows in the Midwest, northern Midwest, and it's, um, it's a toxic plant. But the Native Americans of the region knew how to turn it into a medicinal plant as well. And I think that sort of, um, it sort of summarizes a worldview which is that toxicity also carries with it the potential to be beneficial in some way. And, you know, life isn't a cakewalk. So uh, we encounter our share of toxic, and it's, it's up to us to make the medicinal quality out of it. it it's, so I've never heard of Moonseed. Obviously, it's well known in certain parts of the country. Picking a title for something, do you try to come up with, with, a, with a name that resonates with a larger, you know, a larger uh, audience or or how do you how did you even come up with that name? I mean, you you indicated that it was something that you changed to, but how how did it even come up? Well, the name of the county, this the story has a little bit to do with my mother and the name of the county where she was born and raised was Yellow Medicine County. So I did a research project on Yellow Medicine and where it came from and what it meant and then I had to look through the the literature on the moonseed plant and how the Indians used it. And it was, I, I do some research to come up with things. Uh -huh. I'm working on a collection right now, and I can tell you I'm not looking for a, a title with popular appeal. So it's called Ifatha, which um, is a word that loosely means be here. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's from bi biblical origins. And then that's something that is, that'll be your next book? Um, if I'm very lucky, <laughs> actually, it probably won't because I had another volume of poetry accepted. Oh, wow. That's, that's some time out, but uh, yes. That's great. The Fatha is on the horizon. It must be, I mean, obviously, you've done a lot of writing in your position with Pacifico, but it must be fun to be doing this now where you can, it's not necessarily business related per se, but it's something that that is kind of puts your your passion into uh, into print. Uh, yes, and it's hard work and it's gratifying and it's terrifying <laughs> and it's wonderful. <laughs> all in a, you know, all in a moon seed package. <laughs> OK, so um, tell us um, how how this, how you got published, how, what, what process did you go through and did you get a literary agent or did you go direct um, and, and, and have you had more than one publisher? Yes, I've had more than one publisher. The same publisher uh, published both books of poetry and he's based in, that firm is based in Cincinnati. They claim to be the world's largest publisher of poetry. And um, at one point, Last year, I had probably 170 submissions out with my manuscript, and um, I providentially got introduced to this publisher who said, yeah, I'll take a look. And then he said, yeah, I think this is going to work in our catalog. So, you know, it's, um, it's submission, it's people, it's everything that everything else is in business. It's you know, how you, how diligent you are, who you know and get introduced to, and how you follow up. Yeah. Your next book, you're talking about another book of essays or and another book of poetry. Mm -hmm. Will you be able to work with the same publisher you have for this memoir? He and I haven't talked about it because he doesn't know about it, but no, no <laughs> on the poetry. That's a different publisher, a third publisher. Okay. It won't be bad with the company in, in Cincinnati. No, this is a different one. Okay. I, I guess you're well aware that some of the best-known authors have gone through many rejections before they before they got somebody to say yes. Uh, there are some great stories out there, but uh, uh, it sounds like you've, you've really 
got a, a great publisher now and and uh, hopefully maybe that'll work with your next book of essays. You know, fingers crossed. I'm so honored though right now in this moment to be published by Blaze Vox Press. It's been a wonderful process dealing with a, a wonderful human being who is a communicator. Oh, that's great. What kind of writing schedule do you have? Do you actually do you actually have hours per day kind of thing? Well, I used to have a very defined schedule. I'd write first thing in the morning. And um, I'm married now, so <laughs> you know how you know how it is. Lloyd's spouses kind of mix things up in a wonderful way. So now I find myself writing at night, and I'm I'm a catch as catch can writer too. I mean, if I get an idea, I have to get it down somewhere. And so I have all these notebooks with all these notes and thoughts, and every so often I'll go through them and mine them for what was I thinking that would be useful. It's an interesting process. Sometimes I'm writing all day, every day, uh -huh. and sometimes I'm not. <laughs> okay, the the current one, the new one, when does it hit the market and, and how? what forms will it have? Uh, it will hit the market on January 2nd in book form. Uh -huh. And I do believe that there is the possibility of having it take another form and I just don't remember what the contract says, quite frankly. <laughs> but in the meantime, before January 2nd, let it be noted that I'm holding up a beautiful postcard of the cover of the book. I am passing out postcards with a handy little QR code so people can pre-order this book. Great. And um, I also am active on social media and I post a link to the publisher's website really hoping to, to direct a lot of traffic to the publisher's website before it goes out on Amazon and, you know, he gets less profit out of it. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of the publisher. So you write your, your, your poems, you write your essays. Do you have anybody or a group of people that will read some, some of your early writings and kind of give you some feedback? I used to have a writing group. And unfortunately, one person became very, very high up in the uh, Stanford University administration in the postdoc program. And my other wonderful writing friend moved to Kinderhook, New York, which is not very convenient. <laughs> but the answer is yes. I, you can't write in a vacuum. You have to have, um, you have to understand how how other people are interpreting what you write. And it's good to have mentors. And so I have made a point of, of making sure that I had a couple of really solid mentors. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Uh, do you have editors or an editor that goes over it for you? No, not really. Um, in, in the world in which I operate, it's not like Simon & Schuster where you have a whole cast of characters yeah. who oversee every comma. It's um, <laughs> it's more like when I knew this was going to be published, I hired one of my former employees who's a very good proofreader and paid her to go through it. And uh -huh. she she did a wonderful job. Her name is Adrienne Mock, and she's in San Diego, very easy to work with. And uh, aside from that, no. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've read this book backwards and forwards looking for stuff. And, you know, it's... Um, it's a responsibility. So your publisher basically just accepted it as is, did not have anybody on his or her staff to to no. look it over or anything? No. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. That's great. You're obviously very much into poetry and you're very much into the memoir scene. Do you see yourself at any point writing in a different kind of genre? Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry you asked that. Here's my confession. I have always said to myself, real writers write fiction. And I did try a fiction story, and I turned it in when I was in my MFA program, and my advisor said, well, this looks like a pile of notes for something you plan to write. So that wasn't the most encouraging thing. But I do, I do plan to plan some fiction. One of the things I do in my poetry is I'm very taken with the persona poem. 
And the persona poem is basically where you become someone else and you narrate a story from that person's point of view. I recently wrote one that's a prose poem called White People in Buses. And in writing that poem, I had to, I was working from a postcard from China that I'd picked up when I was there. And I, it was a postcard of a duck pond keeper. And I had to put myself in the position of narrating as if I were the duck pond keeper, which if you think about it, that's really conjecture and fiction. I mean, I have no idea what the guy's name was, <laughs> but I named him. I have no idea what his family was, but I gave him a family. I have no idea whether he lived in, in town or in the pond or, or near the pond, but I put him in town. So that's pure fiction. Okay, all right, that sounds great. I could see you definitely writing fiction. Uh, I, I obviously haven't read the new one. Do the essays basically cover a lot of your work um, history? Almost not at all. Almost not at all. Okay, so have you thought of a nonfiction, uh, I guess another type of memoir that talks about your experiences with Pacifico, the, the, the luminaries, the local luminaries or international luminaries that you've met and worked with, some stories about those kinds of experiences? Are you asking me to write a tell-all? <laughs> That's what it sounds like, isn't it? Yes. I guess no matter what words I use to describe it, I guess that's what it would be. Uh, is that something that you have considered? You know, not really. I mean, I, I did a presentation at my Rotary Club for a half hour, 20 minute, half hour period of time talking about my career and my background. And uh, there's a little bit of that in here because it's it's part of who I am. And it's, I mean, if you think about it, I've really lived through a perfectly wonderful period in te technology history yeah. from 1977 until now. Yeah. And um, dealt with a lot of evolving technologies that have changed absolutely everything about the world. Uh huh. And I suppose I could do it, but there are just other things that strike me as being more of the kind of literary writing that I want to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe when I have a big rainy day someday, but <laughs> it's not it's not on the list right now. All right. Well, it seems like once you do your third book of poetry, your second book of memoir essays. Oh, I've got poems behind those. Oh, there'll be more than three <laughs> books of poetry. <laughs> Who knows? You never know. <laughs> so after you do poetry and memoirs and Fiction, fiction, then maybe it'll be time to do your tell-all. Uh -huh. <laughs> we'll keep in touch on that. <laughs> uh, okay, so you've owned an, a, a PR firm for a long time. Have you taken some of the marketing strategies you used at Pacifico and applied them to marketing your books? Uh, yes and no. I mean, if you think about it, the whole marketing world, the whole advertising and PR world has absolutely changed since I founded the company. And um, and I talk about this a little bit in the book, you know, gone are the days when paid advertising on, on a page or on a TV station or a radio station is really going to produce the kinds of benefits that they used to. The media mix is even more critical now than it was then, but it's a different mix of media. And so, yes, I've taken some of the, certainly some of the PR skills that I have, which is where I ended up being most challenged and had the most fun. Um, I've taken some of those and I've taken my basic knowledge of people in the community like yourself and uh, made contact with absolutely everybody I know. <laughs> but I don't, I'm not running a very cohesive campaign like that for myself. I tend to rely on uh, social media quite a bit, obviously uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, um, and email, good old email, because I have a <laughs> lot of friends. Do so, you have an email email list that you I send do. out? In, uh, I do. I'm married to a spreadsheet jockey, so he's been very helpful with that. Am I on the list? I don't believe I am. Yeah, of course you are. All right. Okay. I haven't sent out much yet. Okay, I fine. I had to get the publication date, which, by the way, is January 2. 
January 2nd. Okay, we'll make sure to to uh, emphasize that. Yep. Uh, do you find it more difficult to promote your own books as opposed to promoting other companies, you know, from your uh, from your business? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> of course. I'm just like every other shoemaker's, you know, dysfunctional <laughs> problem. But I do it. I mean, I I do it and I'm I'm actively thinking about it all the time yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's it it must feel like a totally different direction <laughs> to turning inward rather than outward. Well, it's not chemical vapor deposition <laughs> systems used in the manufacture of semiconductor products, <laughs> that's for sure. And it's a different media set. Yeah, yeah. But but based on all of your connections through the years, I would imagine that that a lot of people that know a lot of people will be getting your notices. That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> Uh, as the CEO of a major marketing agency uh, for a long time, are people who knew you in that context surprised by the the current you, the new you? Um, well, I'll tell you, I don't have a good litmus on the clients, but what I can tell you is that I'm in, in contact with quite a few of my former employees including the woman who did the proofreading project for me. And she said to me, Mary, I never knew who you were. And this has been really eye-opening. She was very complimentary, but it's quite clear that my employees who th thought of me as somewhat of a hard ass, I think, which, you know, <laughs> that's so off base. I'm a mush bucket, <laughs> but I guess I concealed it really well. I think there, I think the employee base is probably pretty surprised. Uh -huh. Well. I can tell you that since my son worked for you for three years, that he had only good things to say about you. Shocking. <laughs> Shocking. But true. That's sweet. Yeah, that's great. Well, secretly, he was one of my favorites. Getting into bookstores, is anybody going to try to do that? Uh, if anybody is trying to do it, it's going to be me trying to do it. It will continue to be for sale on the publisher's website and... Um, there are a few bookstores that I target for just good old Mary making a pitch. Hey, can you shelve my books? But there is no third party who's out trying to represent me to bookstores. Yeah. I mean, if I could, if I could figure out how that happens, I, I would, uh, I would engage them probably. Problem is that you know you look at our town and we don't have a bookstore. Right. And you look at all the bookstores that have closed. Now, I was up in Alaska and Seattle, and they do have bookstores there because, of course, the weather keeps people indoors more. And, and of course, if we were Simon & Schuster again as publisher, maybe they'd have someone organizing book tours. But I have to tell you that in this day and age, book tours aren't what they used to be mm -hmm. because they don't involve getting on a, in a car or on a train yeah, or on a plane. Yeah. It's all Zoom. Yeah. And there's an upside to Zoom and a downside. Obviously, we don't meet face-to-face -face as much. But the upside is you can get places that you couldn't get quickly and cheaply um, in, the, in the good old days. Right, right. And so I haven't refined my strategy for Zoom yet, but I intend to try to have a pretty, a pretty active presence on Zoom. Since we started Zooming in our book club, you know, which was always the author coming into the store because you were one of them, it has enabled us to, first of all, get authors from around the country. Uh, but besides that, it's also enabled us to have some members in different parts of the country that can, can obviously come on the meeting. So it's yeah, a good thing. Yeah. I mean, engaging with book clubs is, it's priceless. It's just yeah. work. Yeah. If you're interested, I know that I can get you over to Recycle Bookstore in Campbell for a book signing. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about that. I wouldn't turn it down. Okay, good. All right. I am going to give a couple of trivia facts uh, because that's what I do. So three quick things. Winnie the Pooh, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle's Farm, and The Hobbit 
were all written as bedtime stories for each author's children. <laughs> uh, the Harry Potter books are considered to be the most banned books in America due to religious complaints. Uh, this is my favorite one of the day. Susan Eloise Hinton, also known as S.E. Hinton, wrote The Outsiders when she was 15. She was frustrated by the lack of relatable pop culture that was being produced for teens, and she used her initials to avoid gender bias. And that's, I think that's a probably a fairly classic, you know, um, teen-related book. So I thought that was pretty cool. That uh, does it for us. Uh, I want to thank, as always, KCAT uh, Radio and for, for sponsoring us, for doing this with us. I want to thank Mary Curtis for coming in. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited about reading your, your book. Uh, and I'm hoping that you're going to get lots of, of attention for it. Well, thank you, Lloyd. It's been an absolute pleasure as usual. You just heard Lit with Lloyd here on KCAT Radio. Explore all our KCAT original programming at kcat.org slash radio.